So I'm Jo and a very, very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the whole of Human Animal Trust, myself and our chair of our trustees, Professor Roberto Laragioni, who unfortunately can't be with us today, um, but we'll be uh, talking at a, a future webinar in the series. So this is the first of our 10 webinars that lead right up to our 10th anniversary on May the 6th, 2024. During the next 45 minutes to an hour, I would love you please to open your hearts and minds and start thinking about the truly importance, the vitality of what one medicine actually is. Really consider what a future of one medicine could look like. If you could please, please turn off your cameras and mics, that would be fantastic and much, much appreciated. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Please, if you can, put them on chat. We've had a few online already. And the slides and a recording will be available on request if you would like to. And if you would like to have a further discussion on any of the topics we discuss either today or in any of our future webinars, then please give us a, a call or an email and uh, get in touch and we can, we can help. So let's start. Human Animal Trust was set up by Professor Noel Fitzpatrick in 20, 2014. On that day, he planted a metaphorical acorn, which over the last nine years, with time, love, and patient nurturing from a dedicated team of predominantly volunteers has grown to a strong, determined and resilient oak tree. Now I've used this metaphor for Human Animal Trust for a number of reasons. One, an acknowledgement of our new king being crowned tomorrow, for the oak is known as the ruling majesty of the woods. Two, the majestic oak, like Human Animal Trust, supports the lives of all species. Three, the leaves, bark and acorns were widely believed to heal many medical ailments, such as diarrhea, inflammation and kidney stones. I'm not saying we can cure those, but through a one medicine approach, collaborating, sharing knowledge and data, we can certainly help humans and animals benefit from a sustainable medical progress. And four, just like an acorn, we started off small, but we are growing. We have a bigger team, bigger message, and like the oak's mighty branches, a bigger reach. So today I will be discussing what, what One Medicine is, talking through our charitable activities, our achievements to date, and our really exciting new strategy for our future. Eva Haltmanova, our research manager, will then talk in more detail about research funding, One Medicine in Action, and all the incredible projects she is working on, before handing back to me for a final few words and some more information on what the rest of the series looks like. So what actually is One Medicine, for those of you who don't know? Basically, it just drives collaboration between vets and doctors and researchers and nurses and all the allied health and scientific disciplines so that humans and animals can benefit from sustainable and equal medical progress, but not at the expense of an animal's life. Many believe One Health and One Medicine are the same thing, but whilst they are interrelated, they are synergistic rather than synonymous with each other. Because One Health is an approach that acknowledges the interconnections between the health of people, animals and plants, and their shared environment. By linking those together, One Health can help to address the full spectrum of disease control from prevention to detection, response and management, and contribute to global health security. One Medicine is fundamentally about collaboration between human and veterinary medicine and reciprocity so that humans and animals benefit equitably and at the same time from medical advances. And of course, to achieve true reciprocity, one medicine seeks to make experimental animal testing obsolete in both human and veterinary medicine. The priority of One Health is to focus on overall human benefit. One medicine seeks an equitable two-way street between human and animal medicine and it's about the incredible connection we have, humans and animals, and how we can all benefit, how we can help, not hinder. And 
what brings the two together, human and veterinary medicine? Language, patient care, love, empathy, compassion, anatomy, biology and physiology and lots of other ologies. There really is so much more that connects us than divides us. And together we can all benefit. What are the benefits? Sharing data, information, experiences from human and animal patients, from initial diagnosis, pre-treatment, during treatment and post-treatment is far more beneficial and superior to artificially inducing a disease or causing harm to an otherwise healthy animal in a laboratory and then killing it. For that can never fully replicate naturally occurring disease. We need to use our common sense. We need to communicate, we need to collaborate. We need to spare lives and we need to save lives. So this chap, Professor Noel Fitzpatrick, founded Humanimal Trust on the 6th of May, 2014, because he'd experienced that deep divide and he thought it was really unfair. He started the trust as a platform to give animals a fair deal and a bridge the divide between human and animal medicine. Doctors and vets and nurses were working alongside each other, learning from each other, trusting each other to do the right thing for their patients. His original dream for a community of compassion and a one medicine approach is as strong today as it was back then. And as a team, we are determined to help make it a reality. And not just for Noel, bless him, but for all of us, for all beings, for our future, for their future. Let us take responsibility and help make the world a kinder place where we care, really, truly care for all beings. It was one of our incredible volunteers who realized that our char charitable activities actually spell out, I care. Influence. We work standalone as an organization, but we also love to collaborate with others, like the World Federation for Animals and Eurogroup for Animals, Alliance to Save Our Antibiotics, because with them, we can truly make that positive change happen. Collaboration. Creating opportunities for collaboration, facilitating joint working and knowledge sharing, not least through our online Humanimal Hub for One Medicine, which is available free to students and qualified human and veterinary clinicians and practitioners. Awareness, working to help everyone really understand and support more ethical medical progress for all patients, regardless of species. Research. Funding research that could benefit both human and animal patients. And we do not fund any research that uses experimental animal models. And lastly, education, because education underpins everything we do. We seek to achieve, to drive medical collaboration so that together we can save time, save money and save more lives. One Medicine Education drives the cultural shift needed to recognise that all patients should have access to appropriate medical treatments, regardless of their species. And that we must actively pursue alternatives to experimental and harmful animal models in research and in education. Our team including our wonderful and highly respected volunteers who give so freely of their time, provide interesting and entertaining talks and presentations to local and national groups. I'm actually giving one myself next week to a, a WI. With the recruitment of a school's education manager earlier this year, we are beginning to help teach the younger generations about our vital connection with other species and help them begin their understanding of the importance of One Medicine. We held our first creative awards this spring, which generated an enormous amount of interest and entrance, and not just from the UK, but as far afield as South Africa, Singapore and Canada, and we will be publishing the winners shortly. 
Later on in the series of talks, Rachel Jackson, our school's education manager, will expand on the work she's been doing and hopes to do in the next few years. We've achieved a lot in just nine short years. The Humanimal Hub launched a few years ago. We now have over 270 members. It's a safe, interactive space where leading minds can meet, collaborate, share knowledge and research. And the hub is growing and it's evolving and there'll be more later on on the hub. Virtual events at both the 2021 symposium, Stronger Together, and the 2022 seminar, One Medicine in Action, more than 100 people were brought together to look at One Medicine approach and the many benefits of a collaboration. These events raise awareness, build connections, and really importantly, help collate the evidence required to make One Medicine a reality. We have a pledge for One Medicine, and 20,000 people globally have now signed that pledge. Again, there will be more information on this later. We need the evidence, obviously, and we have some, but we need more. More case studies, more evidence, because that is crucial. And we need to find more, fund more and share more. The One Medicine Network, our global network, is growing. And we will continue to actively seek collaborations with all One Medicine advocates. And lastly, membership of global organisations. This month, we proudly became an associate member of the World Federation for Animals and the Eurogroup for Animals. We have just started a brand new three year strategy and using those eye care activities, I will share some of our exciting plans. However, please remember, none of these plans can happen without our passionate team of staff and volunteers dedicated to pursuing our purpose and ultimately achieving our vision. We have grown substantially in the last eight months and are in the process of recruiting a fundraising manager. Later this year, we will also be looking at taking on a further education manager who will work alongside Rachel, our school's education manager, to ensure we are able to engage with all students, whatever their age. Our team consists of three Ps, people, passion and purpose, which will ensure we can deliver on the following. Influence. We aim to build a warm network and achieve greater visibility and understanding of One Medicine in England and the devolved nations and European parliamentary institutions. We wish to create an ethical framework for reciprocity in One Medicine. Collaboration. We will continue to grow our global network so we can demonstrate the importance and the impact of a collaboration, both in research and at the clinical call phase between human and veterinary medicine breaking down barriers and building respect. We need to grow the hub and promote it as a safe space for professionals to collaborate, share resources, share opinions and share evidence. Awareness. We need to increase our awareness because it's crucial to raising the funds and achieving the change in human and animal medical education and practice. And research. We need to fund it, facilitate it and shout loudly and proudly about the results using that evidence we can get, gather to prove how a one medicine approach is the only fair future for all humans and animals. An education underpinning it all, we will create and provide teaching resources for all the key stages with national curriculum links, establish CPD activities and set up one medicine societies. So I'll be coming back again later, but for now I would like to introduce you to our incredible research support consultant, Eva Halpmanova. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I shall start sharing my slides and I should probably introduce myself a little bit. So my name is Eva Halpmanova. I have for the past um, 20 years, worked in um, clinical research, in the human clinical research. I hope you can now all see my presentation. 
And I will be telling you a little bit more about the series, but I'll also be talking more about reciprocity and some of the work that we've been doing on One Medicine Societies and a new concept of public guardian involvement and engagement. A little bit about the research funding that is going to be released and also our hub. But before we start, and bear with me a little bit, I'm going to be putting up some questions for you to answer. You've got the QR code there on the slides, so please do. I don't think you can actually see the slides, can you? Here we go. You got the QR code there on the slides, and I will, of course, have to open them separately. So the code, you can either use the code or go to the Mentimeter web page, and the code is written on there as well. So I shall now open the Mentimeter and uh, change what I'm actually sharing so I can see your I can see your responses. You should be able to see the Mentimeter now. So the first question is, do you think one health and one medicine are the same? I'll just give you a few moments just to actually log on and then respond. And there are two slides, so there will be two questions. So once we start seeing some of the responses, I can then move on to the next slides and we will repeat some of those right, right at the end. Just to see if everything, what we've been talking about is um, actually the message that um, is influencing. So I'll give it a few more moments for everybody to respond. Okay, so we have um, so far running fairly, fairly equally in terms of uh, the responses. It's good to know that uh, not sure doesn't seem to be an option for most people. Okay, so I'll now just move it on to the Next question. Obviously, Joe has already been talking about some of those. So do you agree and support the principles of One Medicine? Perfect. That's very good responses. You should still be able to be answering the um, questions while I'll change what I'm sharing with you again. So one uh, additional question that I want you to really just consider in your head rather than answering it on the screen. And that is um, a statement really an experimentally induced animal models of osteoarthritis that have been established in the 1970s and 1980s in dogs and rabbits. Do you think they provide a good model for studying osteoarthritis and its treatment? So as I say, that's something for you to, for you to think about. I do have another couple of questions, so do bear with me. I'm going to change again what I'm going to be sharing, so I shall go back to my uh, Mentimeter section, you can, <coughs> you should be able to start looking at the code. And let me just reset the questions that we are looking at. And of course, you can definitely rely on the fact that the internet is going to be doing a, a little bit of what it wants. <laughs> rather than what it should be. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next set of questions and then I promise you we will carry on talking. So the second set of questions coming up, just bear with me one moment. Okay should be able to see those questions very shortly. Apologies, as I say, my computer definitely decides to do 
slightly different things than I'm asking it to do. And of course, it always works really well when you're practicing it, but not always so well when you're trying to actually do it in practice. <laughs> Let me go back to this. And I have practiced it. I assure you, I did practice it. But as I say, you can always rely on the computer having a slightly different idea. Okay. It's so all fine, Eva. Now, let's see if we are finding it there. So here we go. This is the second series of questions. Do you think that collaboration is important? I'd assume that most people would think that collaboration is important. And again, you can carry on. You should be able to carry on answering the questions as I change to the next slide. And the question is, do you, do you think that the government and the leg regulators should do more to encourage collaboration between human and animal clinicians? Perfect. So I will now go back to my slides so you can still carry on answering the questions. Thank you very much for answering all our questions. I will share the presentation again. So uh, first of all, starting with the One Medicine series. So this is um, a series of really every Friday lunchtime, if you have time. It's a part of a build up to the 10 year anniversary that Joe has already mentioned. It's an online webinar series that will have a quite a wide range of topics suitable for different um, audiences from really lay people to professionals. It will be anyone from school children. As you mentioned, it will be Rachel in the autumn talking about some of the uh, outreach work that she has been doing. It will be suitable for graduates as well as professionals. So uh, there is pretty much something for everybody and you can find out a, a bit more on our website on these. Now I'm just going to remind you a little bit about the definition. Obviously, Joe has already mentioned it. It is a concept that should encourage collaboration really between different healthcare professionals within the human healthcare as well as the veterinary healthcare to ensure that humans as well as animals can benefit from equal and sustainable medical progress, but never at the expense of animals' life. And that's the important emphasis. So what do we actually mean by that? So collaboration human between human and animals clinicians for faster innovation. So knowledge exchange, really making sure that um, clinicians are talking to each other and they can really start exchanging some of the knowledge for the benefit of all the species. So ensuring all species can benefit. And as we mentioned, reciprocity, phasing out all the lab experiment testing through three Rs and utilizing naturally occurring disease models where possible. Emphasis on where possible and also where, su where suitable within a very strict ethical framework. And it's important to acknowledge that actually, even though animal experiments have been around for some time, it has been really over the last few decades that people have started emphasizing the fact that they're not always the most suitable model and they haven't always been helpful. So actually finding new ways and reciprocity being one of them on top of the three R's of how we can improve not just treatment, but also diagnosis is really important emphasis. And then acknowledging the sentience of all beings within their own world and supporting their right to exist without human harm. The concept of Umwelt, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with it, which has been really referring to the perceptual experience of each animal. So it is the environment, the sensory environment within they live in and acknowledging the fact that each species functions slightly differently, but that in no way makes them a lesser being to anyone else. So our emphasis on the benefit should be for all species, not just for the protection of human health. And I think this is the part where we differ from One Health. So One Health, which obviously has started as a public health concept, 
is uh, does recognize that humans and animals and the environment are obviously interconnected and they have the overlapping part where things come together. But one medicine, I think, takes things slightly further. We're not just acknowledging the fact that animals and environments interact. We also like to emphasize the fact that there should be fairness and reciprocity. So I'll give you just a brief example. Uh, one of our scientific committee members sort of put forward, which I think uh, makes it uh, a bit clearer. It's a slightly controversial aspect of, uh, for example, min mink farming, as he proposed. And the difference between one health approach would be if really if there is a if there is an outbreak of a disease within such farm, then obviously the protection of the human overrides everything and it is likely that all the animals would be euthanized. But I think the more one health approach on the fairness and the reciprocity is that probably those farms should not really exist in the first place because there is no reciprocity from the arrangements as far as uh, the species are concerned. So Joe has already obviously showed you this. So it's not just about reducing, replacing and refining, but it is also about reciprocity. And hopefully as a final, final thing is actually phasing out of the experiments entirely. But the collaboration has to continue because if we want animals to also continue from benefiting new treatments, we have to ensure that they are still being factored in. And I think some concern could be raised that if we stopped actually interacting with animals within the experiments altogether, that somehow they will become forgotten, and that is not something that we would uh, we, that we would want. We really want both the animals as well as the humans to have access to really good and innovative treatment. So if I look at the definition from the dictionary in terms of reciprocity, obviously, again, it refers to people. So it is really about two people or groups who do something similar for each other to allow each other to have the same rights. So it slightly reflects that obviously there will be other organizations that will be using BR in slightly different, uh, a different meaning. But from our perspective, it is obviously the acknowledgement that the animals and the entire planet actually provide us with a place to live, us as the humans, but also the animals. And our aim is to ensure mutual benefit to protect all of the species and ensure that any discoveries that are obtained obviously do not cause harm. We want to allow each other to have the same access and the same rights. So if I give you just a little anecdotal example, which is documented. So many years ago, more specifically in the late 1990s in the US, there was a policeman and his police dog who happened to be a Doberman Pinscher, who were both found to be sleeping on the job. Obviously not an ideal situation if you are a working policeman and a working police dog. So when they were caught, they were both sent for their medical and as it turns out, they both had narcolepsy, so actually they can help falling asleep on the job. It is, of course, the fact that some dog breeds are more predisposed to narcolepsy, and the sleeping dog event helped in the discovery of a specific genetic mutation in hypocritic receptor gene. That specific discovery in 1999 has since led to better narcolepsy treatment for both human as well as canine patients. So it's a very good example in terms of um, a discovery, essentially from one dog who has contributed largely to the treatments that we now have for both human and canine patients. So I'm going to now drive you mad again with me fiddling around to go back to the mass meter, having hopefully put forward some of the thinking and the ideas. And, uh, Let's see if I can do it faster this time than I did it last time. So hopefully all the concepts that have been explained and clarified a bit more will now help you answer some of these questions in terms of what you think and where we are with things. So we have the third set of questions now.
which I'm going to share. And again, you will have the QR code or you can go to the Mentimeter website and just put in the number that uh, has been provided for that specific um, for that specific set of questions. So let me change that. Share. There we go. Practice does make perfect. So do you agree with these points that I have just mentioned? And obviously acknowledging the fact that people are entitled to have different opinions. So, and it is anonymous. So please do put down Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. And final question on this one, and there will be one more set of questions. Do you think that this concept is really valuable and can help us improve our relationships with animals as well as the environment? Okay, I'll give you a few more moments again. And again, you can continue answering the questions even after I move back to my slides as the code should be making everything available for you. So I'll go back to my slides and talk a little bit about the One Medicine Societies. So obviously influencing people is uh, not always a very easy task. And I think we acknowledge the fact that while we need to change things today and we need to influence things today that really young people are our future and trying to educate them a bit more about certain aspects of we, what we're trying to do is really important, which is why we are moving forward to establish what we call one medicine societies. Those would be both within universities that are hosting medical schools, nursing schools, allied healthcare professional students, as well as the veterinary. Of course, for that, we require a registration with the student union, and we are planning to have the first pilot of the first ever One Medicine Society to start autumn and the new year term starts. We will, of course, use that as part of our learning to then help us establish such societies around the universities, not just in UK, but hopefully beyond the UK as well. The other novel concept that I mentioned is something that we're going to be referring to as a public guardian involvement and engagement. So as I mentioned, because I have been working for the past 20 years in different aspects of uh, human clinical research, it's a concept that is very well established within human medicine, not just within research, but within healthcare delivery as well. It's referred to as a public and patient involvement and engagement or PPIE for short. So obviously our patients, being uh, animals can't always talk for themselves. They can have behavioral signs that can tell us how they're feeling, but generally it is their guardians who will be looking after their best interest. Why it is important? Well, generally it is considered important to have the inclusion of people to make sure that the decisions that are being made actually still keep being relevant to what the decisions relate to. It can really help to drive positive change and keep the professionals grounded. And I think in human medicine, there has been a lot of work done in the past 20, 30 years to move away from the more paternalistic model of healthcare of, well, the doctor says we mustn't question, we will just do. And it's very important to actually start engaging patients in the conversations because after all, healthcare is about their health. And it's important that the professionals focus on that and don't forget along the way what they're doing and why they're doing it in the first place. So it really does help to keep things on track. And sometimes there's a lot of science for science sake, and it may be very interesting, but actually it's not always very useful and it doesn't really add value. So PPIE has really helped to refocus that. And it helps to, of course, shape ethical frameworks and drive the standards as well. It's, I'm sure it's not, uh, it's not a novel concept of the fact that of course healthcare professionals, once they start working within their roles over time, 
through their professional engagements with people and through the experience they have, they can sometimes become slightly disengaged and uh, what is normal to them is not always normal to the people that they treat. So actually keeping things level and having the ethical frameworks and the drives behind what is happening being put forward, not just by the professionals, but also by the public and the patients is really important. And this is why we also want to introduce this concept in veterinary work and in animal research. So it is about really getting the public and the guardians involved in developing the frameworks that should drive things that should be happening going forward. It's really key, and I'm sure most of you would have heard the concept of uh, social license to operate that public is engaged in what is happening. And while public is obviously aware in terms of what's happening in terms of animal experiments, it's not something that's on everybody's mind. And it's really important that people start engaging with the professionals to drive some of the change that needs to happen. So the plan is that um, we put in together a concept that will help us drive forward the eye care principles. So we want this to be starting in the UK and hopefully then spread beyond as the PPIE has in the human healthcare gradually started off about 20 years ago. We had a fairly slow start, but it has now been spreading pretty much around the world. And we acknowledging the fact that if we want to influence, we do need public and guardians to help and support what we're trying to do. It's if we want to collaborate, we need to involve others and we need to engage not just the professionals, but the wider public and the guardians. If we want to raise awareness, again, we must involve the public, the guardians alongside the professionals. If we want to do research and to use naturally occurring disease and mutually beneficial knowledge exchange, we must engage the public and the guardians to help us shape the ethical framework for that. And of course, as part of that, like the example of One Medicine Societies, we also need the education component in order to influence and actually spread the knowledge going forward. So our plan is to focus on these through PGIE and really help us create the social license to operate on lots, for lots of these activities. So the framework for PGIE is going to be worked up, is being put together right now. And the plan is that we should have our core PGIE group ready by the end of 2023. So do watch this space. We will be putting out a PGIE member call. So if you are interested, keep an eye on our website and we will be selecting some members later in the year. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the funding call that is going to be at in June 2023. So the call is about promoting collaborations for projects that support the concept of one medicine. They can be proof of concept studies. It's a small amount of funding up to 50,000 pounds. And of course, stressing the fact that Human Animal Trust does not fund any research which involves the use of experimental animal models. We will have a specific webinars for those who are considering the funding call in July, so um, it will explain in a bit more detail as to what the funding is for, who can apply and all the different rules and the principles of that specific call. So Joe has already mentioned there are specific five areas that we are focusing on initially, but I think it open to any examples where the concept of one medicine would be useful as well, so infection control antimicrobial resistance, cancer, brain and spine disease, as well as MSK and regenerative medicine. But again, if there are other really good examples that could be put forward, those would be welcome as well. And just to show you some examples of what has previously been funded by the trust. So uh, understanding how osteosarcoma spreads, which was led by Professor Matthew Allen from the University of Cambridge. You may be aware of the fact that actually osteosarcoma as a primary bone cancer is a fairly rare cancer when it comes to humans. And in the UK, there's about 500 people every year diagnosed with a primary and a emphasis on primary osteosarcoma. 
there are subtypes of different bone cancer which are even rarer. But the fact is that the actual incidence in canine patients is so much higher. And if we could utilize the learning from obviously the veterinary world, it could lead to much better diagnostics as well as as well as hopefully treatment for both canine patients as well as the human patients. There are actually some trials that are taking place in, in the US where both the canine patients and the human patients are receiving their treatment in parallel to assess the efficacy. And one of the things that is good news about that is because previously, even with experimental animals, and the animals in these experiments in the US are actually, these are companion animals, these are not experimental animals, so these are animals that have presented at specific specialist veterinary centers. And the good news is that the licensing for use of this treatment in the canine patient is going on at the same time as the human licensing, because previously much of the treatments really that would have been tested on animals are never actually even available to the animals. So the fairness of that statement uh, I shall leave that with you, but pretty much any chemotherapy that is used in the UK and across Europe to treat canine patients is actually not licensed for these animals, even though it would have been previously tested on them. So this sort of collaboration, like osteosarcoma, which is a really good example, is something that could help us improve the diagnosis. The diagnosis in human patients is very difficult, often affects young people, they would be told they have growing pains and sent home before they finally receive their diagnosis. So a closer collaboration with a population where the incident is higher, where the histology and the imaging can really help us accelerate the diagnosis. It's, I think, essential. Another example of a project that has been funded, it was a PhD studentship and specifically looking at the use of bacteriophages which of course are now a big thing in both human as well as uh, veterinary medicine due to the micro, due to the antibiotics not being very responsive. There is a lot of work being done certainly in human medicine in terms of using specific type of Fiji's for specific type of uh, resistant infections for people who have undergone surgical procedures, et cetera. So again, closely studying the link and what knowledge could be exchanged is really, really vital. And just some final example, action medical research, which of course is a children's specific uh, medical research charity. Again, looking at prevent, preventing infection and reducing the risk of antibiotic resistance, and also looking at juvenile idiopathic arthritis and the personalized drug treatment that can be used for that. So in terms of the support we will provide, as I said, we obviously there are the five areas that are listed, but overall, the main focus is on funding project that can support the concept of one medicine. And then just a little bit about the hub that um, Joe has already mentioned, if you haven't already joined, is uh, a free online community for the professionals as well as students. There's lots of interesting information on there. You can find out there's the collaboration cafe that we will be looking at and reviewing to make sure we have a really good engagement. We really encourage, obviously, professionals from both sides of the boundaries to engage on there. And I think that's the main idea of it, to really get people together, to really get people talking, to really get engaging. So we will be actually doing a survey of the current users and start developing a new strategy to ensure that the hub becomes a place to be. So watch this space in terms of the survey. We also hoping to be uploading some of the seminar series on there so they will be accessible for those who want to view them again. Now, just a, a final slide for me before I hand back to Joe. Well, can we make it happen? Well, I'm not going to be defeated, so obviously we can make it happen. And I know for some people, the concept might not exactly be everything they would wish for. For some people, it may be a bit too far. 
but just in the context of history, and we all know that things looking back, things that were acceptable and things that were okay decades ago are no longer acceptable. So just as one example, uh, one of my sort of favorite examples is there was a young lady over 50 years ago who had slightly different idea to the rest of the scientific community. She did to submit a scientific paper and refer to the chimpanzees by names she had given them when she was studying their behavior. Of course, at the time, her slightly predominantly certain group of colleagues absolutely rejected her proposal, sent her her submission back, told her to change the names back to the numbers because that was an acceptable way of uh, looking at these animals. Of course, she refused. And nowadays, we know that lady as Jane Goodall, the world leading famous primatologist and we can have loads of examples like that from history and um, as I always say we know how it went down this Copernicus so I leave you with that and I will be handing over to Joe just to take us off to the end and I shall stop sharing over to you Joe Thank you, Eva. That was absolutely thought provoking and inspiring as always. So thank you very, very much. Right, let me just get this up now. And one second. Excuse me while I just flick through these slides to get back. I haven't quite mastered the uh, the art of getting uh, there already. So what do we want to see in the future? We want to see that human and animal health have demonstrably improved as a result of one medicine. And that it's widely understood, and not just understood, but actually embraced as well. Collaboration between human and animal medicine is not far out, but it is actually the norm and sufficient funding and robust public policy to support collaboration between human and animal medicine. And really importantly, that there is no scientific need and no legal requirement for laboratory animal testing. We all hope for a better future, but hoping alone, just, just hoping on its own doesn't ensure that. So we need to take action today. We need to take action right now, today, for a better, fairer tomorrow. Just as that lovely mighty oak is essential for many species survival, human animal trusts one medicine approach is vital, really is truly vital for all species, all beautiful beings. We need to give animals, humans and animals a fair deal and we need to really bridge that divide between human and animal medicine, offering all patients the same advances and the same opportunities. We can all make a difference individually, just like a tree. But together, as a group, like a forest, we can be a far powerful, a really powerful force for good. With a combined voice, we can ensure that one medicine becomes a reality, which will save time, save money, and most importantly, save lives. So what can you do to help? You can sign the pledge for one medicine. Please, please, if you can, join thousands of amazing people all over the world by signing the Humanimal Trust Pledge for One Medicine, which summarises all that we stand for. You will find more details on the website. Or, we spoke about the hub, join the hub. Or become a volunteer. And yes, of course, as a charity that receives no government funding, we are reliant, wholly reliant, upon donations to continue driving that ethical and equitable medical progress for all patients, humans and animals, regardless of species. Every penny helps drive one medicine to help make animal testing obsolete. So please, if you can make a donation, that would be fantastic. Various options are available on our website. We spoke a little bit about what's coming up next in the One Medicine uh, One Medicine webinar series. So Friday, the 2nd of June, we have the incredible Nick Dukes of Interniche. Interniche is the International Network of Huma Humane Education, and he'll be discussing humane education on their work to end animal experiments and other harmful animal use.
Friday the 7th of July, our gorgeous Eva will be talking again about the small project funding call and everything you need to know how to apply. Many of you will be taking a break in August, uh, so too will the webinar, but we will recommence again in September. And I will pass over to Eva now for some more questions. So I promise you this is the final one. <laughs> and I got it ready while Jill was talking, so all being well. Far more organised than me, Eva, thank you. <laughs> You should now be able to see the final set of questions. So obviously, the first one is, did you find the session informative and did you enjoy it? And we will have some time to obviously take some questions at the end. But of course, if we do run out of time, understanding we've well got an hour and people have other commitments as well. We will be accepting questions as well that you can send through after the session. And just one last question from me. So I know most of you already didn't think that there were some of you. So do you have we managed to change your opinion on any of the things? And do you think one medicine and one health are the same? So it's good to see we now don't have any yeses. So that's definitely good to see. So we've done a good job there with Joe. You should still be able to see the um, Mentimeter even, though I will now stop sharing and um, we'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has. You can type the questions into the chat and or they will be picked up from there. Or if you, as I say, if you don't feel comfortable asking the questions right now, do feel free to obviously email them after, after the session. I'm happy to give any answers after the session. So we haven't got um, some nice comments from, from the team. Don't seem to have any questions. I'll give it a little moment to see if anybody will be putting any questions forward. As Eva said, if you do have any thoughts um, or questions in future, please don't hesitate to contact us and we can set up a call or even a meeting and we'd be overjoyed to be able to talk through um, whatever, whatever you're thinking about One Medicine. That looks like it looks like we've uh, everyone's just ready for their lunch, I think, Eva. So I think if no questions or comments come in now, I think we'll just uh, leave it there. And I'd just like to say thank you so very, very much for your time today. It really is time to raise the roof on One Medicine. So please support us in any way you can by raising awareness, raising funds and helping us make One Medicine a reality. Now you've considered it's time to act today for a better tomorrow for all beings. Thank you so very much, very much for your time and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.